Hi, this is Elliot from EO Nutrition and today's video is going to be looking at how certain plants in the diet can actually contain things which stop our body's ability to break down proteins and fats. So these things are called enzyme inhibitors and they play a very important role in plant physiology, but they can potentially cause um, lots of digestive distress in human beings and actually stop us from being able to um, absorb nutrition coming from other foods. So really this is in response to a lot of pure nonsense coming from the plant-based community that animal foods are somehow supposedly difficult to digest and that we should therefore be consuming plant proteins instead. What we're gonna look at in this video is we're gonna turn that idea on its head and say that animal, animal proteins are probably the easiest to digest because of the fact that animal foods do not take or do not contain um, the enzyme inhibitors or the anti-digestive factors which are contained within plants. Furthermore, towards the end of the video, we will see how there are actually pro-digestive factors in animal products, specifically in aged or hung meat, which means that when we eat hung meat, it's actually in a, a moderately pre-digested form, and this actually increases the meat's digestibility. It's very important to understand at this point that plants contain these kind of protease or lipase inhibitors for very specific reasons, okay? So one of those reasons is actually protection against microorganisms and insects. So microorganisms in the wild um, would try to basically colonize a plant and the way that they'll break down the plant's cell wall is using enzymes. They use proteolytic enzymes. And what this is doing is essentially attacking the structure of the plant. And so plants release specific enzyme inhibitors as a means of protection. But furthermore, if we look at where plant uh, enzyme inhibitors are mostly found, and we'll go into this in some more depth shortly, it's actually in the seeds, okay? So plant seeds are notoriously high in enzyme inhibitors. And this is for a very important reason. In the, in the wild, what happens is, is when a seed germinates or when a seed is planted in the soil, it needs to survive, okay? And it needs to basically detect environmental stimuli such as light, moisture, temperature, and seasonal variation, and determine when it's actually going to flourish and grow into a seedling. So seeds sometimes need to remain dormant in the soil for a very long time until the environmental conditions are perfect. And so the way that it does this is it inhibits the enzymes inside the seed, which are responsible for kickstarting that growth process. The way that it inhibits them is using protease inhibitors. Okay, so the protease inhibitor is essentially a tool used by the seed, used by the plant, it, it, basically to modulate when that plant grows, when it doesn't grow. Because if the plant grows at the wrong time of year, then it's potentially going to die. Okay, so the protease inhibitor, the enzyme inhibitor, is a way that the plant can adapt to the environment and kickstart growth processes when the time is right. So first of all, it's important to look at the basic functions of an enzyme and what enzymes actually do, how they work in the human body and why they are so important for digesting different types of food. So for those who aren't aware, enzymes are a certain type of protein which allow us to take one thing and convert it into another thing, okay? And so the way that they do that is they have something they call it they have a section on the protein called the active site and so the thing that you want to take and turn it into something else is called the substrate and so the substrate is binding to the active site of the enzyme and through a cascade of events the substrate is essentially being broken down or changed in some way um, to produce what is called the product. Okay, so we start off with the substrate and we, are, we end up with the product. Now, in this diagram, what we're doing is we're taking a large molecule, 
okay? And we are breaking it down into its constituent parts. So sucrose is made up of a glucose and a fructose. And what we're doing through an enzyme called sucrase, which is very specific to sucrose, it's binding with sucrose and actually cleaving the bond and producing glucose and fructose. And this is very important in the context of digestion because what we need to do is we consume large molecules such as fats, you know, carbohydrates, proteins, and what we need to do is we need to break them down into their smaller building blocks. We do this via enzymes food. We have to basically break it down to be able to absorb it. One example is proteins. We can't absorb um, steak. <laughs> what we do is we break it down into its constituent peptides and amino acids and we absorb those instead. So ideally with protein digestion we are going to take full proteins and break them down all the way into amino acids. But unfortunately what we need to do, there's several steps in that process. We can't, it's not one reaction, in fact it involves a set of reactions um, and using various different types of enzymes along the different steps along the way. Now we essentially have enzymes all throughout the digestive tract. They start in the mouth and then we have enzymes in the stomach and in the, in the intestine. Um, now although there's enzymes in, this, in the mouth, we, we're not actually going to focus on those today. We're going to focus on the stomach and the intestine. So first of all, we're actually going to look at the journey that protein takes after we consume it. So what happens is after chewing, um, a bolus of food, a bolus of protein is going down into the stomach. And in response to a hormone called gastrin, certain cells called enterochromaffin-like cells release a, a, a product called histamine. And histamine is going to induce these cells called parietal cells to release gastric acid into the stomach. Okay, so th there's two main components of this. One is hydrochloric acid. And what this does is it actually um, functions to, to produce a very low pH, which means very acidic. And what this means is that it's gonna prevent things like bacterial colonization. It's gonna kill off unwanted bacteria. And it actually acts to denature proteins to prepare them to be digested or broken down further um, by enzymes, okay? Another really key role here is actually to activate um, one of the proenzymes or the pre-enzymes called pepsinogen. So uh, along with hydrochloric acid in the stomach, you're actually re re releasing this thing called pe pepsinogen. And pepsinogen, usually its active, active site is blocked. So what this means is, is it's not going to be, the enzyme isn't functioning. However, when there is very um, high acidity or low pH, what actually happen, happens is the active site is freed up on the en enzyme. And this goes on to form pepsin. So as the initial proteolytic enzyme, Pepsin's role is to take full proteins and actually break them down, uh, cleave some of those bonds and form polypeptides. This is like the next step down from proteins. Now what I haven't mentioned here is that enzymes can actually be classified based on the amino acids which make up their structure. Okay, so pepsin, its classification is as an uh, aspartic protease. Okay, what this means is, is that there's two aspartic acid residues on the active site of the enzyme. So this particular class of enzymes um, are inhibited by several different plant foods. Okay, you see that there are various kinds of squash. There are um, small beans, pumpkin, flax, uh, some nuts like peanuts, walnuts, uh, grains such as oats and wheat and, and lentils is, is a legume and soya bean. The, I mean, there are lots of frequently consumed foods which actually inhibit pepsin in the stomach. So although pepsin is the initial stage of protein breakdown, the majority of protein is actually going to be broken down in the small intestine by a set of other enzymes. After food has been broken down in the stomach, it will go to the small intestine, uh, the upper part of the small intestine called the duodenum. Now when it gets there, the pancreas is actually going to release um, a set of enzymes. 
And the two main enzymes that we're gonna focus on today are trypsin and chymotrypsin. So these are very important to break down the polypeptides into smaller peptides. So much like pepsin in the stomach, um, trypsin and chymotrypsin are actually gonna be released in their inactive form. Okay, so that is as trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen. So these need to be activated. And the way that trypsinogen is activated, first of all, is actually by another enzyme called enterokinase. And enterokinase is located on the brush border of the lining of the small intestine. So when trypsinogen comes across enterokinase, it becomes activated into trypsin, and trypsin subsequently goes on to activate other digestive enzymes which have also been released by the pancreas. One of those is chymotrypsin. Enterokinase is essential for activating these two very important proteolytic enzymes. Now, interestingly enough, you may have guessed, but there are also many plants which have been shown to significantly inhibit enterokinase. Some of those include potato, Jerusalem artichoke, taro, onion, elephant yam, arrowroot. There are many different foods. And so inhibiting enterokinase is not a good idea because ideally you really want to be able to break down your proteins. But let's just assume that enterokinase could do its job. Let's assume that we could activate these pre-enzymes into trypsin and chymotrypsin and that we've got sufficient amounts. And so trypsin and chymotrypsin are what are referred to as serine proteases, which means that they have a serine amino acid in their active site. What inhibits serine proteases? Well, we have rice, pumpkin, cucumber, zucchini, watermelon, lots of different plant compounds actually. There are plant components referred to as serpins and these are serine protease inhibitors. The nightshade family, many different grains, nuts and seeds. And there is also a class called plant cystatins or phytocystatins, which also inhibit serine proteases. However, for the sake of this talk, let's just say that everything works really well. After protein digestion by these enzymes, other proteases such as carboxypeptidase and other brush border enzymes located on the brush border of the intestine are essentially gonna break down those very small peptides into amino acids. And when you have amino acids, these are going to be absorbed. And that means that you can do things with them. And now in an ordinary context, around 85% of the protein that we consume is actually digested. Whereas 15% is likely gonna come out in the stool or is gonna be fermented by gut bacteria. Okay, that's normal physiology. However, in the context of undigested protein, when this increases to a large extent, what this is going to do is if there is intestinal permeability or leaky gut, so to speak, this is going to potentially lead to an in increase in food immune reactivity. So immune reactivity, the, the, the development of immunoglobulins, a lack of all tolerance against certain types of foods, okay? Because the immune system is picking up undigested proteins as essential potential invaders. And what it's doing then is actually mediating or, or it's um, initiating an immune response against those foods. And so it's really, really important to be able to break down our proteins all the way into amino acids. And now undigested proteins and this immune reactivity to foods has been um, thoroughly implicated in autoimmunity, in the development of autoimmunity. And I recommend that you go to the work of Aristo Vajdani or Alessio Fasano to learn more about this because there has been lots of work done over the past couple of decades demonstrating that when the gut builds up an immune response against foods, 
potentially undigested proteins, then what is happening is that this is potentially going to lead to cross-reactivity with our own tissues. And so now I hope that you can appreciate how consuming high levels of certain plants can actually be impairing the body's ability to, um, to break down and actually utilize proteins. Now it seems to get worse than that. There are many people who seem to have problems with fat digestion and fat emulsification. And so there are also many plant compounds which actually impair our, bo our body's ability to break down fats as well. So fat's journey is slightly different, but it's important to know that most of the dietary fat that we are consuming is in the form of triglycerides. Now what this means is that there's a glycerol backbone connected to three fatty acids, okay? And the enzyme that we are gonna use to break the triglyceride down into its constituent parts is called pancreatic lipase. This is coming from the pancreas and it's actually being secreted into the um, intestine. And as you might have guessed, again, there are a number of different types of plant compounds which are actually pancreatic lipase inhibitors. So we have um, the flavonoids, which are said to be really healthy. We have quercetin and caneferol. We have components found in cinnamon, such as hydroxycinamic acid. Other compounds which are supposed to be amazing for our health, such as the carotenoids and the alkaloids, saponins and terpenoids, certain polyphenolic compounds found in plants um, and things that we should supposedly be supplementing with. But actually, these all have really strong activity against lipases. They can stop our ability or they can reduce our ability to actually break down fats properly. Again, the basic polysaccharides in grains have also been shown to inhibit the breakdown of these fats by the lipases. So aside from fat simply as an energy source, dietary fat is also gonna be coming with the fat soluble vitamins, such as vitamin E or D, vitamin A, vitamin K2, and then also other kinds of fat soluble compounds or components such as coenzyme Q10. And so if there's a problem with digesting and emulsifying fat, then there's also a problem with absorbing the fat soluble nutrients. We can see how plant enzyme inhibitors, although they play a very important role in plant physiology, in plant survival, in plant adaptation to the environment, um, they can actually cause lots of problems for human digestion. Now, Many plant-based advocates will have you believe that meat is very difficult to digest, but in fact, what we're gonna look at now is in comparison to plants, which contain all of these different enzyme inhibitors, these protease inhibitors, lipase inhibitors, enterokinase inhibitors, you know, all of these plants, and there's so many of them, which clearly have a detrimental effect on our digestion, we're gonna compare that to meat. Now meat's got a really bad rap. Animal foods are said to be really difficult to digest. But in fact, no one talks about the fact that meat contains its own enzymes. So this endogenous enzyme system in meat has actually been stu studied very thoroughly um, in the context of meat tenderness. So we know that when meat is hung, say for 30 days or longer, actually improves the tenderness of the meat. And so this is one of the reasons why they do that, why it's so important. And actually the reason or the way that that works is because when meat is hung or when meat is left, there is actually an activation of certain enzymes called cowpains. Okay, what these do, these are proteolytic enzymes. And what they do is they break down myofibrillar and cytoskeletal proteins inside the muscle cells. Now, calpanes are an important component or an important system in most eukaryotic organisms. But in fact, when we look at when an animal has been slaughtered and meat is left to age, 
what happens is, is this activates the activity or this increases the activity of these proteolytic enzymes. Aging increases the, what is called the PHU of proteins. In the research, one factor which is determining the overall digestibility of a protein is referred to as the PHU, okay? So the pH of the protein is going to affect how well your body digests it. And it's interesting because the research shows that aging meat, because there's a higher activity of these proteolytic enzymes, is actually increasing the PHU, which increases meat digestibility. When we're eating meat, it's already in a pre-digested form because of the calvane system. So in stark contrast to what the plant-based advocates would have you believe, it would seem that meat is really quite good on the digestion. So I hope now that you can understand why consuming certain plants could actually be having a very detrimental effect on your digestion. And whilst many people are quick to blame animal products um, for any digestive distress that they might have, it could actually be because they're consuming too many plants or they're consuming the wrong kinds of plants. And this is actually stopping their body from being able to break down the protein, break down the fat in animal foods. And so if you ever find undigested uh, food in your stool, if your stool floats or if you have like chronic diarrhea, chronic constipation, it might really be worth considering what plants you're consuming, how many plants you're consuming and whether it would actually be a better option to avoid the plant foods and actually focus on nutrient -den dense animal products which tend to be much easier on the digestive tract. So thanks for watching and if you like this video, please share it, please subscribe to my YouTube page. You can find me on Facebook as EO Nutrition. You can find me on my website at www.eonutrition.co.uk and stay tuned for next time.